Good morning and welcome to those who are with us in person and those who are watching online. It is indeed good to have everyone here. Uh, this is, a, of course, a very special day. Happy New Year. In uh, French, I think it's Bonne Année. Now I'm going to teach you a new one. As I served the church in Hawaii for about 30 years, Happy New Year in Hawaii goes like this. It's three words, haoli, which means happy, makahiki, gathering, ho, H-O-U. So haoli, makahiki, ho, all together now. Haoli, makahiki, ho. Now when you go home today, you can say that to someone, and maybe they'll think you're speaking in tongues. We continue with our celebration. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God in the highest, and peace to God's people. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, worship you, we give you thanks. Eternal Father, you gave to your incarnate Son the holy name of Jesus to be the sign of our salvation. Plant in every heart, we pray, the love of him who is the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Numbers. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, 
and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her hearts. The shepherds turned and glorifying and praising God for all they had heard, as had been told them. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have not already done so, please be seated. I am very grateful to Father Peter for filling in on such short notice today, as I have joined the vast majority of our, my fellow Americans who have had at least one run-in with COVID. I trust that by Sunday, when you hear this, I will be feeling better, uh, but it is probably better that I am not among you, at least until I know that I am no longer contagious. In any case, this is what I would have said had I been there in person this morning. Sometime in the 1640s, the English Puritans, praise God, and Sarah Barbon welcomed the birth of their son, whom they named Nicholas. If Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned, Barbon. For obvious reasons, the younger Mr. Barbon rarely used his middle name in professional or social settings, much less on his stationery. Among his contemporaries were people with the unlikely names Job raked out of the ashes, fight the good fight of faith, kill sin, sorry for sin, search the scriptures, and fly fornication. Next to these, the more familiar so-called virtue names like prudence, constance, faith, hope, and charity seem positively banal. The Puritans may have been guilty of unkindness to their children, we can only imagine what playground trials, abstinence, and no merit must have endured. But they did have a clear idea about one thing. Names can have a significance assigned to them beyond just their decorative value and their capacity to help us keep track of who's who. Many, maybe even most, names have meanings that speak about character traits that parents hope their children may grow up, grow up to have. Albert, we're told, means noble and bright. Naomi means pleasantness. My own name, Howell, means high-spirited or ornery in Welsh. This phenomenon also works in reverse. Some names are made famous by the accomplishments of their bearers, and some come to have a symbolic power that survives their deaths, and which eventually comes to have a life of its own. When we hear Einstein or Marilyn or Gandhi, as different as they may have been in their worldly experience, we think less of the person than of what he or she represented. This is all very entertaining, but it has spiritual relevance for us as well. Today is the feast of the holy name of Jesus. Eight days after Christmas, it commemorates the occasion when Mary and Joseph would have followed Jewish custom and had Jesus circumcised and given an official name. It was and is customary to wait a few days after birth to ensure that a child would survive before giving him or her a name. In this case, although the custom was observed, the question of a name was long since settled. Depending upon which gospel story we read, one or both parents had already been given this information by divine message. 
But before we dig into the name of Jesus any further, it's worth stopping simply to notice that this scene is happening at all. Recall that on various occasions in the Torah, humans interacting with God ask for the divine name. Viewed sympathetically, this may have been motivated by a desire to form a firmer relationship on the basis of mutual familiarity. We all want to go where everyone knows your name. Viewed more cynically, it may have been an attempt to control God by the ancient understanding that to know the name of something or someone was to have control over it. Whatever the rationale, humans asked and God always declined to answer. The Hebrew understanding, which we inherit, was and is that God simply is, with capital I and S. And this seems right somehow. If the creator of all things had a name like anyone or anything else, how would God be any different from us by anything other than degree? Indeed, certainly not by nature. A God of that sort might be suitable to ask for a favor, but would hardly be worth, worthy of worship. A character in Job says, Behold, God is exalted, and we do not know him. And Isaiah says, God's understanding is unsearchable. Even St. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been God's counselor? It seems as if the greatness of God and the namelessness of God have gone hand in hand. Until today, that is. Until Christmas shocked us with the arrival of God in person. In a person. In someone who most certainly does have a name. This fact alone is enough to make today noteworthy. In the coming of Jesus, God chooses to become known, to be named, and so to be in a new and familiar relationship with us. By some mystery, God enters our reality and shares all of our experience while remaining the God of the burning bush and the silence that confronts Elijah. But Jesus is more than just the heavenly PR department. His name becomes a vocabulary for us. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name. We confess our sins and ask forgiveness in Jesus' name. Some brave souls cast out demons in Jesus' name. And the writer of the Gospel of John tells us that to believe in his name is to receive power to become children of God. All of which should inspire in us a strong interest in the name of Jesus, what it means, and what we commit to when we take it up and call upon it. Put simply, Jesus... Yah and Shua in Hebrew means God saves. Like the names of his latter-day Puritan followers, the name of Jesus expresses a conviction about godly qualities. But unlike them, his name isn't just about aspiration. Quite the contrary. In Jesus, God is revealing the fullness, the completion of his plan to reconcile the world to himself, already triumphant in the life, death, and resurrection of the Son born at Christmas. That makes beautiful theological poetry, and it might make us plenty comfortable to say only this much, promise to meditate on it later, and leave the subject. But we can't. We who pray and work and teach and struggle in Jesus' name must do so with eyes open, adopting the name of Jesus, becoming part of the Jesus movement, to use the term popular in Episcopal circles at the moment, requires us to know what we're doing. First, and most importantly, we are publishing our belief that God does indeed save, and not just in some vague philosophical sense. We are confessing our faith that God is active in the world, and that through him our lives have been changed, and that this promise has been made available to everyone. To take up the name of Jesus is to promise to build a billboard, to buy airtime during the Super Bowl, to make his name known by any and every means possible. That kind of talk usually means bringing out the smelling salts in Episcopal congregations, but it shouldn't. Our billboards and commercial time are our own lives. This is easy to see in the life of almost any ordained person. We get to wear the clothes that prevent us from hiding in public. I've mentioned here before now how I think that every member of the clergy should have to ride the New York City subway in uniform at least once a week. Almost every time I did it, I ended up in a conversation in which I'm sure God was eavesdropping. For those who've been spared the blessings and struggles of the ordained life, it may seem to be harder. 
that may be more a matter of perception than of reality. Simply to live a gentle and ethical life is often enough to attract attention. It would be easy to say that this is a consequence of the wickedness of modern life, but I'm not convinced it hasn't always been true. If simple gestures of kindness don't inspire fear and trembling in you, maybe they should. They reveal the God of life just as much as the miracle working that most of us aren't equipped for anyway. In any case, start small. That's what God did in Bethlehem. The second thing we're doing when we call on the name of Jesus is proclaiming our confidence in God's project for the world and pledging our support to it. But simply, we're affirming that creation and humanity are worth saving, and we are on board to do whatever we can to help. It should be clear that God doesn't require our seal of approval, but it should be equally apparent that our full and unconditional willingness to participate in the mission of God is the least we can do in return for what we and everyone else have been and are being given. In our common life, this is visible in our continuing concern for those who have no other help. It's visible in our willingness to fill gaps that others find unprofitable or distasteful or simply a waste of time. And it's visible in our stubborn refusal to concede to the skeptics and cynics the sad view that humanity has outgrown God and is on its own. Our work in the world, done with Jesus unashamedly on our sleeve, proclaims his name and our confidence in his power. The third thing we're doing in claiming the name of Jesus is agreeing to do things his way. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we follow one who prayed and lived the belief that the will of God is the greatest good. That doesn't mean that the expression of our own longings is wrong, only that their fulfillment is tied to a bigger plan that we don't and can't see completely. The name of Jesus is both the lordly name of the one through whom all things were made, and also the humble name of the one who assumed the position of a servant. For us, this means vulnerability. The world sees success and failure as measures of human wisdom. To truly believe that the will of God governs our destiny exposes us to ridicule when our best efforts fail to produce what the world judges to be worthy results. Our vindication is not on the world's time or in the world's terms. So, dear friends, this is the kind of name we are claiming. Are you up to the challenge? Do you have enough Puritan in you to go out into the world calling yourself, God is my strength, or healing is in Jesus? That is, after all, what we promise to do today and every day that we call on the name of Jesus. May God give us the grace to claim it boldly and wear it with joy. Amen. Well, let's proclaim our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page one. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
we pray for God's faithfulness to be known in our world. In a world of change and hope, of fear and adventure, faithful God, glorify your name. In human rebellion and obedience, in our seeking and our finding, faithful God, glorify your name. In the common life of our society, in prosperity and need, faithful God, glorify your name. In places of war and peace, in strife and harmony, faithful God, glorify your name. As your church proclaims your goodness in words and action, faithful God, glorify your name. Where your word is unknown or rejected, and where is, there is a longing to hear it, faithful God, glorify your name. Among our friends and in our homes, faithful God, glorify your name. Among the sick and the helpless, and those who care for them, faithful God, glorify your name. In our times of joy, our days of sorrow, faithful God, glorify your name. In our strengths and triumphs, in our weakness and at our death, faithful God, glorify your name. In your saints and glory, on the day of Christ's coming, faithful God, glorify your name. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose years never fail and whose mercies are new each returning day, let the radiance of your spirit renew our lives, warming our hearts and giving light to our minds, that we may pass the coming year in joyful obedience and firm faith through him who is the beginning and the end, your Son Christ our Lord, who is alive <coughs> and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And Greet those around you with the sign of peace. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Our Eucharistic prayer continues at the bottom of page 12 of your service bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is in our right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you gave Jesus Christ, your only Son, to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was made perfect man of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become your children. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your goodness, from your creation, this bread and this wine. We pray, O gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. 
Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country. For with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Thomas, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are they who are called to the supper of the Lamb. O Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul will be healed. the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. One final instruction. There are two chalices, one for sipping, one for dipping, or intinct. Intinct is a fancy Episcopalian word for dip. So when you dip the host into the white chalice, be careful not to get your fingers all messy with wine. Just put it in a little ways.
Father, Christ the bread of heaven. The body of Christ the bread of heaven. The body of Christ the bread of heaven. As you are able, I invite you to stand. Together, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Day by day, we send out Eucharistic visitors to take the sacrament to those who cannot be with us in church. 
This good work may take place on Sunday afternoon, but it may also be on Tuesday evening or Friday morning. To keep it in our hearts, on the first Sunday of the month, we pray for this holy work and those who serve in it. In the name of God and of this congregation, we send out Eucharistic ministers bearing the bread and wine of the Holy Eucharist. We pray that those who bear it and those who receive it will know the presence of Christ and the love and concern that we send with it. May God bless this ministry and all who are touched by it. Amen. Let us remember those who are celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries. For those celebrating wedding anniversaries, Almighty God, giver of life and love, bless those celebrating another year of marriage. Grant them wisdom and devotion in the ordering of their common life, that each may be to the other a strength in need, a counselor in perplexity, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. And so knit their wills together in your will and their spirits in your spirit, that they may live together in love and peace all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And those celebrating birthdays, I count myself among those celebrating a birthday this past week. I'm eight years old. God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen them, strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do we have announcements this morning? May Almighty God, who sent his Son to take our nature upon him, Bless us in this holy season, scatter the darkness of sin, and brighten our hearts with the light of his holiness. Amen. May God, who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill us with joy and make us heralds of the gospel. Amen. May God, who in the word made flesh, join heaven to earth and earth to heaven, give us his peace and favor. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Yeah. 